Good morning, everyone. I trust that this is working. Um, so, my name is Peter Ballersted, and I am talking to you from Western Oregon in the United States, the northwest corner of the country. And I want to share some information that I hope will be useful, um, and certainly in some of the conversations that we get involved with. Um, so I've posted a link to a set of um, a PDF print of a slide set. Um, I put the link in the comment section for yesterday's announcement of this session. Um, and you may want to follow along with those. You won't be able to see them in this video. I'm trained as a forage agronomist. That is the sciences related, soil science, plant science, um, agriculture, in the production of crops that are going to be consumed by livestock. I also have a degree in ruminant nutrition and I have a personal experience with uh, improving my health as a result of adopting a restricted carbohydrate lifestyle. Started that in 2007, so 10 years, a little over 10 years ago now. And at the time I was out of agriculture, um, I'd been working for a high tech company and as I read books like Protein Power and then uh, Good Calories, Bad Calories, Gary Taubes' book when that came out, and, and many others, websites, blogs, etc., uh, I found myself really getting reintroduced into agriculture. And today I work for a seed company, but I am not here in any way as a representative of the seed company. So I like to help people understand both sides of the conversation. I get to go around the country and to other countries actually and try to spread the good news um, of restricted carbohydrate, uh, high fat diet, uh, how uh, butter, red meat and cheese do belong in a healthy diet despite what we've been told for decades. Also, I get to speak to audiences that know about that dietary message, but try to talk to them about some of the realities of agriculture. And since this audience really knows the dietary message, um, I won't spend a lot of time on that, just a couple basic assumptions. Uh, and then I'll spend more time talking about what are ruminants, what's their ecological role, and maybe give some information to help us feel more comfortable uh, with the dietary choices that we're making, as well as perhaps uh, equip us for some of the conversations that we may get involved in. So uh, again, we, we are in a world where there's been this narrative that says that plant-based diets are healthier than diets that contain animal products. So I like to say that ruminants rule because they eat plants so that we don't have to. And I'll talk about those uh, ideas as we go along. Again, I said I'm an agronomist. I get to interact with people that are in agriculture, and so I very much want to make sure um, that the message that I convey is factual and science-based. Uh, and I hope that by doing that, we can avoid getting ourselves into some of the controversies that are out there, uh, because I think those controversies will um, marginalize our bigger message, which is that um, for people who find themselves, for example, with metabolic syndrome, um, the first step that they should be counseled to do is to adopt um, a high-fat, low-carbohydrate diet 
uh, as well as information about maybe some biomarkers and things that aren't part of the current message of health and nutrition. Um, I firmly believe from everything I understand from getting to listen to researchers and clinicians and to actually review the research that the most pressing problem we face in our public health, certainly in the United States and in many other parts of the world, is hyperinsulinemia. This condition of chronically elevated insulin that seems to be plausibly associated with so many other um, diseases, chronic illnesses. And uh, in the United States, every single day, about 200 people have some portion of their body amputated because of poorly managed diabetes. I can't think of anything else that's more important. Um, and, and I know that there are narratives out there that say there are, but I think the evidence doesn't support it. Um, the last figures I saw were something approaching a billion dollars a day being spent for overt diabetes care which if the researchers and clinicians that I uh, respect are right, then it's far more than, quote, just diabetes that's involved here. So we really need to address that, and that's going to, for the most part, involve diets that are higher in animal products, lower in plant products, especially sugars and refined carbohydrates, um, starches, because sugar obviously would be a refined carbohydrate. Uh, how are we going to produce those foods? H how, how are we going to get those in an affordable form uh, to most of the public? Um, forage agriculture is the agriculture that produces butter, meat, and cheese, to coin a phrase from Nina Teicholz. Um, regardless of what is frequently said, regardless of how the animals end up being finished, the vast majority of the feed in the United States that supports all the livestock of the United States is forage. And this is a resource that humans can't utilize and it can be produced on ground that can't produce foods that humans can utilize. So uh, again, we need to make sure that we have an accurate understanding as we consider some of these topics. Um, again, my personal belief is summed up by I dream of the day when the public understands that their consumption of meat and butter and full fat dairy products, for example, lessens their need for diabetes care supplies. And that day is coming. More and more people are understanding this. Unfortunately, there are some competing narratives that get in the way and we really need to make sure that we're not um, contributing to that confusion because there's more than enough confusion out there already. Um, and if that's true, then this, this is the result of ruminant animals. And I'll define ruminants quickly, but cows, sheep, goats. Um, we, I'm getting a little distracted by messages. Um, forgive me. I, I think it's accurate to say that the problem is not the grain-fed cattle, it's the grain-fed people. Now, I blog and write under the heading of grass-based health. Um, that's an accurate description of where I am. Ruminant agriculture is grass-based in the broad sense of equating forage with grass, and that's a little simplistic. But um, if this is true that hyperinsulinemia is the right thing for us to be focusing on rather than these other messages, then grain-fed, grass-fed doesn't affect that. 
So um, the problem is the grain-fed people, not the grain-fed cattle. And there's lots of things that we could also talk about, but we need to focus on the big things first, you know, the sort of 80-20, let's get 80% of the way there, and then we can worry about the rest. Uh, too long we've had this narrative that plant-based diets uh, and maybe even exclusively plant-based diets are healthier than diets that contain animal products. And that there's just no data to support that. Uh, that's belief system, that's narrative, that's many other things. And if someone is in that position, I don't mean to denigrate, but I do mean to engage in what we can point to as objective information. I came across a quote from uh, former President uh, John Fitzgerald Kennedy back in 62. Um, the great enemy of truth is very often not the lie, deliberate, contrived, and dishonest, but the myth, perva persistent, pervasive, or sorry, persuasive and unrealistic. Too often we hold fast to the cliches of our forebearers. We subject all facts to a prefabricated set of interpretations. We enjoy the comfort of opinion without the discomfort of thought. And that is so true when it comes to the area of human nutrition and public health. And certainly this audience has come to understand that. Um, the point that I would make and, and wish to have a discussion about is that the dietary goals leading to the guidelines, they didn't just spring up out of thin air. They came out of a time and a worldview and belief systems. And I want people to understand that. So um, when you have influential vegetarian cookbooks being referenced in the dietary goals, the product of the Senate subcommittee, Senator McGovern subcommittee, and when you have advocates for vegetarianism being cited as references in that document that then went on to produce the dietary guidelines, which you know every five years we get the new revision of in the United States, we really should look at that and, and maybe step back and say, have we deconstructed this message sufficiently? Or are there more narratives and worldviews that need to be looked at? And I hope I can contribute to that here. Um, because uh, as, as Zoe Harcum said in, in one of her summary slides, um, one of her points, the, the Senate Select Committee finds that no physical or mental harm could, come, could result from the dietary guidelines recommended for the general public. There were people trying to raise concerns. There were people acting as scientists saying, you need to be a little cautious about your interpretation of some of this information. And again, this is back in the 70s. Um, but the, di the people involved in that process that created the dietary goals were speculating. They were making predictions. And they couldn't imagine harm because they were convinced that they were right. They weren't able to see that there might be harm here of recommending that people go on a low fat, high carbohydrate, replace animal products with plant products diet. There were people trying to warn them. They couldn't see it. It's a caution to all of us. Um, but since that time, we've had abundant data as a demonstration or at least allow for the observation that while it might not be correct to say that the dietary guidelines caused this, it certainly is accurate to say that the dietary guidelines didn't prevent it. And so today we're in this, the grips of this epidemic of chronic illnesses um, led by obesity and overweight but certainly diabetes is rocketing along and now, as I've mentioned, it might be more appropriate to look at all of these diseases as being related under the umbrella of metabolic illness. So to borrow uh, Gary Taubes' uh, title, what, 
what if it's all been a big fat lie? All of these varying messages that all have led to enriching some and empowering some and at the same time harming many. Um, and, and unfortunately, the world that we live in, some of these players get a pass. We think that we don't question them as rigorously as we question others in, in the food debates uh, and arguments. So I, I, I'm a shameless leverager. I see stuff out on Twitter and Facebook, and I, I take it and I use it, and I try to give credit where credit is due. And if any of you notice that I'm using your lines and I haven't given you credit, please let me know, but please forgive me. Um, uh, some time ago, what was it, back in February, I saw um, Sean Baker posted um, a tweet, and it said, wouldn't it be amazing if there was a single food that tasted great, provided complete nutrition, and caused muscle gain and fat loss? And he has a picture of a nicely cooked piece of beef. And um, I took that and put it in my own tweet and said, and wouldn't it be really amazing if there were a way to convert inedible by humans materials into high quality food for humans, utilizing that portion of the Earth's surface that cannot produce human utilizable foodstuffs while improving the environment and improving health and increasing human flourishing? Oh, wait ruminants rule. And part of what I'm trying to do is get um, people to become more aware of the, the greatness that, is, that are ruminants. And I look for things that are catchy and so I, I try to refer to this group of people both from production, agriculture, and from the general public who are aware of the importance and the, uh, and the great value of ruminants. I refer to them as the ruminati. And I'm looking for more people to join the ruminati. Um, so a few points to review. And, and anyone interested can contact me. I have references for all these prepared. Maybe if I remember, I'll, I'll post that in somewhere on the ADAPT. Uh, your life um, page. Um, so nutrition research, and this is a quote from Professor Joanne Slavin, human nutritionist, uh, University of Minnesota. Uh, nutrition research does not support that vegetarian diets are healthier than animal-based diets. Um, number two, the hypothesis that natural saturated fats from animal products causes vascular diseases has been refuted. The hypothesis that dietary cholesterol led to vascular diseases was never supported by research. It was primarily a marketing campaign promoting plant product replacements for animal products. Uh, number four, animal protein is superior to plant protein for human nutrition. Uh, number five, polyunsaturated fatty acids from plants have been shown to produce harm in humans. Uh, number six, diets high in animal products and restricted in carbohydrates, that is high in natural fats, have been shown to produce greater weight loss, better blood glucose control, and reduced cardiovascular disease risks than low fat, that is high carbohydrate diets. Number seven, ruminants are not competitive to humans. They convert plant protein, and I put that in quotes, and low nutrient density organic materials into food for humans via anaerobic microbial fermentation. I say protein in quotes because when we talk about protein in plants, we're most of the time referring to what we call crude protein and most of the food labels will list protein, but my understanding is that's crude protein. And the way we get to that measure is we analyze some foodstuffs for nitrogen content. And so we then have a percent nitrogen in the dry matter. We then multiply that number by 6.25 
to convert crude protein, uh, sorry, to convert nitrogen percent into crude protein because we assume that all the nitrogen that's in that foodstuff is in protein. Well, in plants, that's not safe. And then we also make a further assumption that all of the pro all of the protein there in that food sample is 16% nitrogen. And, and that's another questionable assumption. But that's how we get that number. Uh, but when we feed, and, and we'll get into what n ruminants do with that nitrogenous material in a second. And then the eighth point is that modern humans exist because of ruminants. Uh, modern societies depend on them and that they will be critical to meeting the future needs of humanity as the population continues to grow. So um, I can't remember the uh, researchers that Dr. Eads cites, but I've had the pleasure of seeing many of his presentations. And in those, especially on the origins of the paleo diet, he cites the work and makes the comment that um, we didn't, we as human beings, as modern humans, didn't evolve be, to eat meat. We evolved because we ate meat. And I would add to that the information that suggests that we also evolved as a result of learning how to cook meat and other materials to make them more energy dense um, so that we could extract more energy from the, the naturally occurring resources in our various environments. And today as we go, uh, we can look across all of the climactic zones of the world and find human beings who have domesticated li uh, herbiv sorry, ruminants in those environments to help them survive in those environments. In other words, the ruminants convert resources from those varied um, environments that the humans then can utilize the milk, meat, and byproducts like hair and uh, leather and use animals for draft and those other um, resources. Uh, oops, um, need to go back up, sorry. Um, that won't affect anything on the video, but it sure affects me. Um, so, uh, a quote that I have from Peter Cleave, in 1973 for a modern disease to be related to an old-fashioned food, in this case red meat, is one of the most ludicrous things I've ever heard in my life. And he was speaking to the Senate committee, he was trying to warn them, but again, they had different worldview. And they were convinced that red meat was harmful to humans, um, certainly if you ate too much and maybe if you ate any at all. And then they were also convinced that uh, environmentally we couldn't, f we, we were destroying the planet by raising livestock and that we couldn't feed a growing population by feeding livestock. All of those are myths, um, but they're influential myths, um, persistent uh, myths. Um, so again, people will talk about ruminant animals now. Again, a ruminant animal is one that has four, a multi-compartmented stomach. It has four primary components. Uh, two of them are really regions of the same area. The reticulum and the rumen are just different parts of a big structure. And then you get to the uh, omasum and abomasum, and you get to more distinct regions with very distinct functions. But um, the, these animals are ingesting a low-fat, high-fiber, and poor, low protein, poor quality protein diet. Um, they house within that reticular rumen a very large microbial population. There's no oxygen in there, uh, so it's anaerobic. And in that environment, those microorganisms, 
uh, fall, uh, uh, can break down the fibrous material as well as the cell contents. They will produce byproducts as well as more of themselves, uh, which the animal then harvests and absorbs. Also, the ruminant is going to ruminate, which is to form boluses of this ingested fibrous material and bring them back up into its mouth and chew them again to mechanically break down that fibrous material and make it more digestible. Um, these animals have absolutely essential roles within the ecology of any environment that they live in. They convert this structural and non-structural carbohydrate into fat. Um, plants, grass doesn't just contain fiber, it also contains a number of non-structural carbohydrates. They convert that plant protein and non-protein nitrogen into high-quality animal protein. There's no such thing as an essential amino acid in the ruminant's diet. So they can form uh, this high-quality protein for us to ingest, and we do have essential amino acids in our diet. Uh, they reduce unstable polyunsaturated fatty acids into monounsaturated and stable saturated fatty acids. Um, that's a little appreciated but very important role. They produce vitamin B12 and other vitamins. They increase the bioavailability of essential uh, minerals. They degrade anti-quality plant components like phytates and, and other uh, secondary metabolites that plants produce as a means of self-protection against insects and disease. They maintain the health of the grassland ecosystems. If you don't graze them, if you don't burn them, grasslands degrade in quality. Um, they recycle nutrients and they build soil health, which is a very um, exciting new area of research, this soil health discussion. Um, they provide services, I mentioned draft, uh, mechanical power to pull loads or carry loads, and they provide byproducts like leather and, and many, many others. They also generate new wealth, uh, very important in many, many communities, not just in agricultural production in the West. Life on Earth is a process of cycling carbon dioxide. Photosynthesis is the capture of the radiant energy from sunlight and converting that into a chemical energy, um, which are primarily carbohydrates. So these plants uh, and other photoautotrophic organisms capture this energy and then other organisms like us, which technically are called heterotrophic organisms, can capture that energy, utilize that energy either directly in the case of the ruminant animal by grazing plants or like us as a second step by then eating the products of ruminant animal agriculture. Now we're omnivorous, we can also eat plants, but um, and, and that cycling of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere into plants, into animals, back to the atmosphere is absolutely essential to life on Earth. If I could take 38% of the carbon dioxide that's currently in the atmosphere out of the atmosphere, that level of remaining carbohydra uh, sorry, CO2 in the atmosphere is not sufficient to support photosynthesis. So in other words, plant growth would stagnate. In other words, life on Earth would stagnate because not only do we have energy production from photosynthesis, we also produce oxygen, which obviously we have to have. Now the carbohydrate that's produced by photosynthesis is primarily um, cellulose. It's the most abundant carbohydrate in the biosphere, and, and it's just a, a large polymer of glucose units, but they're linked beta 1,4 is the technical. Um, starch is also a polymer of 
glucose units, but they're linked alpha-1,4. And so we obviously, and other vertebrates, can use amylose or starch because we produce amylase, the enzyme. No vertebrate produces cellulase, the enzyme necessary to degrade those beta-1,4 bonds. So the most abundant carbohydrate in the biosphere can only be utilized by the microorganisms that produce cellulase. Ruminants, again, are different from us because they have this multi-compartmented stomach. And what that means from sort of a dietary practical point of view is that the, the diets of ruminant animals are primarily carbohydrate and protein. You can't put too much fat into a rumen without having that uh, impede the fermentation process. So there's a very low level of fat that can be in the ruminant diet. Simple stomached animals like us or pigs or chickens, um, carbohydrates, proteins, fats, we're all familiar with that. Now our stomach is a gastric digestive process, stomach and intestine. Um, hydrochloric acid, stomach acid, as well as pepsin uh, enzyme works on the food that we eat and then that flows into our intestines from which we absorb sugar and amino acids and fatty acids. With the ruminant, we're producing methane, volatile fatty acids, and um, ammonia in the rumen we're also producing the microbial protein that I mentioned a little earlier. That microbial protein is going to flow into the omasum and abomasum. The abomasum we can think of like our stomach. It's where gastric digestion starts in the room. And from the intestine of a ruminant, they're going to absorb primarily amino acids, mostly from, again, the microbial protein. There's very little sugar that's going to be there to be di absorbed because it was all fermented back in the rumen. And again, there's not a lot of fatty acids coming into the uh, intestines. So the practical point is that we have a, an animal eating less than 5% crude fat ether extract in her ration, and yet 60 to 70% of her energy is going to end up coming from volatile fatty acids that were produced in the rumen as the microorganisms degraded that fibrous material. Ironically, then, w we really shouldn't look at a, a ruminant animal as a, as a vegetarian in that sense, or an herbivore. Um, although technically, of course, they are herbivores. But what they really are is microbivores, <laughs> to coin a phrase, or they're microbians, because that's absolutely essential to um, their, how they get energy out of their diet. Again, there's a difference between ingest and digest. So if we look at all of the domesticated species across the world, the, the, the animals that humans have formed this uh, contract with, if you will, um, there's really about 47 species, and 21 of those are ruminants. Uh, but 75% of those animals uh, are, are herbivores. So humans for a very long time have been domesticating animals so that they could utilize this resource to produce feedstuffs for us to use. 
Um, again, ruminants, there's about 134 species total. 21 of those have been domesticated. I make the point that they're not competitive humans. Um, I've explained the, the, the role that they play and the services that they provide. The Earth's surface is finite, two-thirds of its ocean, but 14% of it is rangeland. And this is land that's incapable of producing crops that are directly utilizable by humans. About 10% of the Earth's surface, and I'm talking total surface, not just land area, um, are forests. And we can raise livestock in conjunction with forestry practices. 5% um, is non-productive. It's mountaintops, it's deserts, it's you know, Arctic tundra. Um, or it's Antarctica. 4% um, can be cultivated. That's it. So as we think about feeding and expanding population, um, we need to be looking at making better use of these other resources. 1% um, is urbanized, and of course, as the urbanized area grows, it tends to grow at the expense of the um, uh, the cultivated land. Uh, an example for people who are familiar, um, if you go to Colorado and that area around Denver, uh, north and south, we refer to that as the Front Range, and it's tremendously productive agricultural area, but the urban sprawl has been displacing agriculture and now we have housing tracts. Um, so, as we continue to grow in population, it's reasonable to expect that we'll have less uh, cultivated land available, which means even more that we make better use of the, those other parts to produce food. Uh, if you look at just the arable land then, because part of the argument is, well, if we weren't feeding grain or whatever to livestock, then we could have more to feed humans. And that's an argument that can be easily deconstructed. It's factually incorrect. Um, but of the arable land, uh, less than a quarter is actually producing feedstuffs for feeding humans. And in addition, the land that's 77% that's producing food and fiber for human beings also provides byproducts that can be fed to livestock. And so we tend to have these discussions about these things being either or when in fact they're integrated and it's hard to pull them apart accurately. Um, the challenge ahead in 2050, the UN is projecting that there'll be two billion more people in the world to feed. Uh, they also are suggesting that that's going to require a doubling of our food production over current levels to meet that demand and that that's going to include a 60 percent increase in animal products, meat and eggs and milk, um, in part because of the growing population but also because it's, it's a growingly prosperous population and as populations become more prosperous they then want animal products because they can afford them, they become more available. Um, and it's interesting too because prosperous societies can afford to invest in conservation. And it's prosperous societies that can afford the luxury of being concerned about their environments. Um, so we need to engage in what I call a ruminant revolution because that two billion more people is already coming. I saw just the other day a prediction that says that by I think the mid 2020s they're projecting will already be to eight billion people. Um, and so in the 60s and 70s while people were predicting coming famines and all these dire apocalypses. People were doing work that ultimately meant that a billion people didn't have to starve. And there were people at the time talking about how we should let them starve and that would be a good thing. 
very dark um, mindset. Um, those people, by the way, weren't where the people would be starving, by the way. They were in the affluent West uh, who could afford that kind of delusion. Um, so at the time we had, of course, the Green Revolution, and um, I'm making reference to what I'm calling the Ruminant Revolution. Because if we look, it, it's, it's interesting, at least to me, that the, Europe only has about 12 percent of the beef and dairy cattle in the world when you look at worldwide population. But they produce almost half of the milk supply of the world. And so one of the things that we ought to be doing if we want to reduce the environmental impact is to improve the efficiency. Um, and, and clearly improved efficiency means less, um, or sorry, more it output per animal. So, and too often we have this romance that if we go back to some sort of former time, that that somehow will be better. Um, Okay, so I see that message. Thank you. Uh, I'll keep. I'll move along quickly. Um, so I mentioned before what the, the the diet of livestock actually is, and the importance of ruminant animals, uh, how they actually increase the human edible protein supply of the world, and this is at a time when in the United States most Ameri uh, forty percent of Americans aren't getting enough protein. This is based on NHANES data. Um, and most females over the age of eight aren't getting enough protein. That number is worse because they consider plant protein and animal protein to be synonymous, which they're not. Animal protein is superior to plant protein for human nutrition. Um, there are various topics that come up fr uh, about greenhouse gas emissions and they're used as arguments about how we shouldn't eat a low carb high fat diet or a carnivorous diet or a diet based more on animal products. Um, a quote that I have is that uh, cows are nature's carbon capture technology as well as a cheap source of protein for the world. And what I find interesting is that um, we can expand that to all ruminants not just cattle and they ignore fat when they talk about this. They've become so lipophobic that even within the industry, they can't talk about the value of the fat as an important product. Um, 430 some billion dollars a year come from six commodities, meat and milk from ruminants. That's new wealth generation. That's really important. Um, again, cows and caribou, sheep and springboks are not alchemists. They cannot create carbon or nitrogen out of nothing. They're cycling nutrients, but too often the conversations that come at us is that they're only looking at the emissions, not the source that cycles through the ruminant animal. And, and again, there's, there's information that we could talk about, and I, I try to make that information available. Um, but just some work that was done in the southeastern U.S., for example, they looked at the increase in soil carbon as a result of going to improve grazing management, dairy pasture, it's irrigated pasture. They saw a, a three-tenths of a percentage point increase each year in soil carbon, which represents an increase in soil organic matter. And if you were to apply that kind of change to just 10% of the degraded row crop ground in just the southeastern United States. That would be enough carbon per year to equal 3.5 billion cars or, or 38.5 billion barrels of oil or 4.3 thousand coal-fired power plants. We only have 1,300 in the United States in 2012. So I would make the argument that this has never been about cattle emissions. It's been about this belief in plant-based diets are better. Um, really we don't have to worry about this, I guess. And, and then we can look at the quality of the food that we can buy even in the supermarket. We, we dare not make this an elitist, um, inaccessible message. 
if someone is challenged financially, they don't need to feel bad about going to Safeway to buy the hamburger that's on sale or buy the eggs that are on sale. Um, they will make a profound improvement in their health. There's lots of aspects. I don't know now how we're doing with time. Maybe I better um, stop if there's questions uh, before I continue forward. I'm looking for a message from Glenn. He might be able to direct me. Um, I'll continue because there are more slides in the set that I posted. Um, the difference between grass-fed and grain-finished ruminant animal products is nowhere near as significant as people confidently talk about. Um, so I don't want people to get upset about that. If they want that, that's fine. Um, you know, I know of people who tell me their experience and they uh, ascribe some personal uh, health improvement as a result of shifting all to grass-fed beef. That's great and I'm glad that they can find that. Uh, and I'm glad that there's producers that are willing to go to the extra effort and expense to do that. Um, but if they're still eating pork and chicken, I'm a little confused because those products are always going to have a higher omega-6 to omega-3 ratio than beef, for example, regardless of how it's finished. It's the nature of the digestive system. People are concerned about hormones. Um, and the irony, of course, is that anyone who's interested or concerned about hormones in commercial beef who is eating soy products <laughs> is missing the point by orders of magnitude. In some cases, multiple orders of magnitude. It's, it's really quite remarkable when you look at the data. And the reality is nitrates was a concern, and it's really not an issue. Uh, and it's become more a marketing spin. Pesticides and antibiotic residues is another non-issue. It, it's important, but not in the way that it's commonly thought. There's a lot of effort, there's a lot of testing. Certainly in the United States, we can feel very comfortable with the food that we're eating. Uh, antibiotic resistance is a real thing. The biggest source of antibiotic resistance that's of interest to human beings is the medical care system, not agriculture, but maybe time's too constrained to get into. Animal welfare is an issue, but if you're making your livelihood producing animal products, believe me, you're concerned about animal welfare and animal welfare and animal rights are two very different things. There are others, I want to hear about them, so I'm looking forward to interacting with people. Uh, I can be found um, in, in a number of places online, on Twitter, on Facebook, and I'm grateful for this opportunity. Um, so Glenn, if I just stop talking now, is there a question and answer, or do I just press finish at this point? And I'll wait and see if any message comes up. I see a couple messages. Good morning, Toronto. I've had the pleasure of being there a couple times. Sometimes not a pleasure when I get stuck in the airport, but that's not your fault. Thank you. Glenn, OK. Um, OK, I'll just log off now. Thank you very much. Good day, everybody.